morning, everyone. more detail there. <laughs> so, um, welcome to Lakeside. And um, today we have a couple of announcements. Um, Jamie has gotten a couple of cards we'd like everyone to sign today if at all possible. One is for Irv and Dorothy Acoust, who have their 63rd wedding anniversary tomorrow, which is awesome. And they're not here today because Dorothy is from COVID. So, we're going to, you know, what a happy celebration. We'll pray for continued strength and stuff. And she's feeling a whole lot better, but just not good enough to be here. She doesn't want to share, and we appreciate that. <laughs> the other card is from Mary, um, our church secretary, who has, believe it or not, been here about 20 years. So, we're actually going to celebrate next week. Um, when she's here in church, but we want you to sign the card today. Remember, next week, there will be pictures being taken. You do not have to turn around and smile at the camera. None of those things. Um, just know that as she's taking pictures, if you really, really don't want to be in them, sitting on the edges this time is a really good choice. Okay? You sit on the edges, you won't be in anything. <laughs> All right? I'm just saying. Otherwise, make sure you do your hair. And these pictures are for what? For the website. We are making huge progress on the website. Um, we've already approved copy, and she's starting to pull together the, we have what's called, and I don't understand what this is, but they're called wireframes. So we can see what the layout's going to be. She's going to start building that on the actual website. Maybe this next week. So it's really coming along, and I'm very excited that um, we're going to be into 2024 instead of 2000. <laughs> so that's really. Um, other things that are happening don't forget about Bible study. Okay? Next week. We are doing backpack and or work bag or any other kind of bag blessing so that um, you'll be set for the year. But it's also a way to, to get you know everybody geared up for the school year. So um, if you have something you want blessed, not a problem. If we can put a pin on it, it will be blessed. Even if we can't put a pin on it, I'm sure Pastor Becker will bless it anyhow. Um, also, today, um, Trudy and her mom, Elsie, have made, again, quilts for um, Freyert, and they will be blessed and then sent off to the kidney center. Um, and Jamie graciously takes those with her to use by her patients, so that's wonderful. Last but not least, remember Outreach for Hope. I guess I lied. This is not bad. Outreach for Hope is in the middle of September. You can sponsor people on the website. Amy and I, and hopefully Max, will be walking the shortest route. I thought about doing the shortest bike ride, but it's a trail ride, and I figured that would boink Max right out of his basket. So, we're gonna walk. It's better for all of us, safer. <laughs> And then the pet blessing will be the first week in October. And we had a wonderful suggestion from one of our members saying, he said, why don't we do a pet food drive for the pet blessing? So we're going to do that. So if you would like to contribute, you can just bring the food here. We'll make sure it gets where it needs to go. But I think that's a really wonderful idea. And what a great way to share the love we have for our pets with people who don't have as much. So, any other announcements for the congregation? I guess anything? Oh. Please rise as we begin this time. 
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. Help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and be us for the life of the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the man from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, you are more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. Let us join our gathering song, Be Thou My Vision, number 793. <laughs>
ever loving God, your Son gives himself as living bread for the life of the world. Fill us with such a knowledge of his presence that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life to serve you continually. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we have a reading. from the book of Proverbs, chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven floors. She has slaughtered her animals. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out the serving girls she calls from the highest places in the town. You are that simple. Turn in here to those without sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading comes from Paul's letters to Ephesians chapter 5. Be careful, then, how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God, the Father, at all times, and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Pictures of movie vampires often. But Pastor Becca, 
you might ask. What could this possibly have to do with the Gospel of John? My problems not getting there. But you see, while Twilight was the craze during my adolescent years, it was certainly dramatic. But it wasn't exactly new. For as long as humans have been telling stories, we've had stories about vampires. Not necessarily the vampire that you probably imagine, a very spooky or pale man in a cloak that lives in some sort of castle that sucks people's blood, but creatures of the night. Creatures like demons and monsters that look like humans but aren't quite right. Creatures that feast on the flesh of other humans. And there's something very deep within us that just knows this is wrong. Pretty much every culture all through history has had a taboo against eating human flesh. It is something that just has a visceral reaction within us, an aversion that we can't quite explain, but we know is just wrong. And Jesus' first century followers would have been no exception to that. So let's remember, at this point in the story, they haven't had the Last Supper yet. They have no concept of communion. So when Jesus makes this crazy turn in this discourse, from talking about eating bread to talking about eating his flesh, they would have been good and shocked. Well, he's sort of dipping in and out of this metaphor, bringing together literal bread and heavenly bread and all these other things that we've been talking about these past few weeks. This is where he makes a really hard turn into the sort of metaphysical, spiritual, metaphorical. And one of the best pieces I ever heard about, about reading the book of John in particular, is that if you read something and it seems particularly shocking, particularly out of the norm, out of the track we've been in so far, it's on purpose. Jesus is doing something to shock us to make us look a little closer. Because Jesus, like any good speaker, preacher, advertiser, knows the value of shock, the way to catch people's attention and make them go, wait, what did you just say? And really think about it. And that's part of what makes Jesus' teaching so radical, so compelling, is that they were shocking. He did and said often shocking things. And it was sometimes just to prove a point, to snap people out of whatever they had been thinking and make them think a new way. And I think we can really see that in action in this text because what he's saying is pretty darn shocking. I would imagine that most people here were raised either in or around the Christian church, or at least had some vague notion of the Christian Christian church most of your life. Just growing up in the Western world, it's hard to avoid. Most of us have probably been hearing this phrase, this is my body given for you, and this is my blood shed for you, since we were too little to even really know what it meant. The thought of eating Jesus' flesh and drinking Jesus' blood is shockingly normal for most of us. We don't give it a lot of thought because it's just something we do every week. We certainly don't associate it with any sort of cannibalism or vampires or any of that other crazy stuff that you usually see in fantasy novels. But this is exactly what the earliest church was thinking about when all these Jesus followers started talking about eating flesh and drinking blood. As I'm reading this text, I'm sure we can see why all those non-Christians were looking at the Christians and going, what are they doing in there? Because these words are startling. But of course, we know that Jesus is not calling us to consume physical human flesh or physical human blood. Instead, Jesus is making a much bigger more complicated and frankly more interesting point about what the sacrificial relationship is between God incarnate, Jesus Christ, and all of us. So let's dig in on this word flesh a little bit. It's a pretty 
a visceral word, a word that feels absolutely grounded in physical reality. We as humans are made out of flesh. It was, makes up our bodies. And in traditional Jewish thought, there wasn't really this sort of dichotomy that we sometimes see between mind and body, where your mind is the real you and your body is just sort of this thing that carries you around. They would have deeply understood the body as a part of your being, who you are, your physical presence in this world. So in emphasizing this fleshiness, Jesus is really speaking to who he is. And he is a human man, come to walk on this world with all the vulnerabilities that any one of us in flesh has, vulnerable to injury and even to death. And Jesus here is beginning to explain to his disciples, even if they're totally not ready for it yet, that he is going to give up that very body and sacrifice for that. His flesh and his blood, the things that make him human, are the very things that he is going to sacrifice, that he is going to give up so that we might live. Now, some people will take this passage as a very literal interpretation of communion, and I don't necessarily disagree with that, but I think there's more to be said. Jesus isn't just explaining what's going to happen at this table for years to come. He's really talking about this sacrifice, the way his flesh and blood are going to be destroyed for the sake of his people. So in saying that they, we, should eat that flesh and drink that blood, he's saying that we take part in that sacrificial relationship that we get to be nourished, fed, by the loss of his body, by the loss of his life. His body, his blood, his flesh, his very being becomes the very thing that forgives our sins. So when we consume body and blood, we don't believe that we are actually consuming Jesus. In the Lutheran Church, we don't hold a theology of transubstantiation, which some of you may have heard of, where this bread and wine turns into physical flesh and blood. But what we do understand is that Jesus is fully present at this table, that he is here with us, in us, nourishing us, feeding us, giving us strength to go on, and the forgiveness to do so in God's grace. This meal is a not, not just a reminder of that sacrifice, but truly taking part of it, in stepping into Jesus' story, and taking it into our very selves. It's that prayer we pray after communion, let us become what we have consumed, your very body given for this world. This table is a promise that we are one flesh in Christ, that we have all been brought together in this body to be the people of God, loved, forgiven, and saved. And our whole selves, body, body, mind, flesh, blood, all of those things are invited into full relationship. And I bet you can see why that was a lot for the disciples to take in. Frankly, it's a lot for me to take in sometimes, and we have the benefit of 2,000 years of study on the matter. At the end of the day, what Jesus does here is just so unusual. It's novel. It's radical. Most of his message, love your neighbor, feed the poor, take care of the children and the widows, that was good stuff, but it wasn't exactly new. The people have been reading it in the Torah for thousands of years at that point. But what was new was this idea of a God that took on human flesh and made the ultimate sacrifice so that we would never have to sacrifice again. So that we could be in a relationship so close that it changes who we are, our very flesh and blood, spirit and essence. 
E along tau. Hence, it had that. Please rise as you are able and join our hymn of the day. Rise up, O saints of God, number 669. <laughs> Spirit of wisdom to guide our hearts and our minds. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Our petitions this morning will end with mercy of God, to which all are invited to respond. Receive our prayer. Wisdom has built your house. May the church be a house of wisdom for all who enter. May we continue to grow and stretch in ways we never thought possible. Merciful God. Our Wisdom has mixed her wine. May the harvest seasons be plentiful this year. We pray for orchards, vineyards, farms, and all of creation, as well as those who work for it. Protect and conserve the earth. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Wisdom has employed her laborers. Be with all who seek adequate employment. Guide our economic and governmental leaders to support the people of our world with fair wages and safe working conditions. Most of God, we see our prayer. Wisdom has invited her guests. Make your presence known to all who feel lost, abandoned, or hurting at this time. Direct your spirit of care to all who seek healing and comfort, especially those we name our hearts for love. Merciful. Merciful God, we see our prayer. Wisdom has set her table. May this congregation be a welcome table to all who seek the refuge of God. Break down walls and barriers that prevent us from offering a seat at this table to anyone who comes. Merciful God, we see our prayer. Wisdom has shown her path of insight. 
may we journey on your paths, looking to our bright future while remembering from where we have come. We give our thanks to those who have gone before us. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We lift up these prayers to you, gracious Lord. Receive them into your holy Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please share a sign of peace with those around you. Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day 
overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the hosts in heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Temptation, but 
Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us with this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. And the Lord look upon you and give you grace and peace. Amen. Amen. Let us join our singing song, Let All Things Now Living, for 881.